Thank you very much, Alan. It's a, a joy to be here tonight. And my God, there are a lot of you <laughs> out there. Um, so, so I'm 17, and I've run away from home. I've run away from school, and I find myself in Japan to be a potter. And I spend a very long summer going from kiln to kiln all the way around Japan, learning how to ground myself in clay. And after my long summer in my jeans with very long hair, and I think possibly a cheesecloth shirt, it is the 70s, I end up in Tokyo. And I go to see my great uncle Iggy. And I ring the doorbell of his apartment somewhat nervously. And the door opens, and there is an elderly Austrian gentleman, beautifully dressed, with a cravat. And he welcomes me in, and he offers me a whiskey sour. I'm 17. <laughs> and behind him, in his drawing room in Tokyo, looking out over Tokyo, a beautiful, beautiful apartment. There are a vitrine of Netsuke, small objects. And he says, glancingly, that there's a story about these objects. And then we talk about jazz, and we drink our whiskey sours, and the next day he takes me and buys me a proper suit and a haircut. <laughs> and 25 years later, I have small children, and I'm busy as a potter, and I inherit a collection of 264 small Japanese netsuke. But what do they mean? What do these objects hold within them? What do these objects carry with them? I decide that I need to understand this story. I need to find a way of understanding the weight of these objects in my hand. So I decide I'm going to trace the story of these objects. So I go to see my father, who's old, elderly, living in North London, my lovely Jewish father, who has grown up in Vienna, grown up in Paris, became a refugee in 1939, and became the Anglican Dean of Canterbury. <laughs> and I say to him, what do you know about the family? You've never told me about the family. And he says, that's no problem. If you want to write the story, I'll find things for you. I'll help you on your way. And he comes down the next day to my studio with five volumes of Thomas Mann and three letters. That, he says, is the family archive. I can't remember anything else. I'm on my own. But I have a start to my story. One place I know where these objects, these Japanese objects, started. So I decide that if I'm going to be on my own, I'm going to do this story properly to try and understand what they mean. And the place that I begin is in Paris, in the Rue Monceau. I find that my Japanese family, my Jewish family, was a Jewish dynasty that had started in Odessa at the end of the 18th century and cornered the market in grain and become oligarchically rich and sent their children, like pure, good Jewish dynastic families, all the way around Europe. Half the family was sent here to Paris and half to Vienna, with the object of marrying good Jewish girls and getting even richer. And in the Rue Monceau, they build themselves their first Parisian house. It's an extraordinarily beautiful hill of, of golden houses. And I found the house in which the Efrissi brothers, these three brothers who've been sent to Paris, settle. And the first brother becomes the banker and does all the right things. He marries the right Jewish girl, and he's completely in charge of what he should be doing. And the second brother is a playboy. He has what the um, 
Parisian press calls appetites, which means that I discover that um, I have lots of French cousins um, <laughs> in the most unlikely places. And the third brother, Charles Effroussi, has nothing to do. He's a young man, and he loves art. And in this beautiful apartment in the Rue Monceau, in the 1860s, he starts to collect art, and he begins by collecting Medici embroideries. And he buys the Medici bed and unstitches the M for Medici and puts E for Efrussi. He's 21, <laughs> and buys from the Louvre a Savonnerie carpet of the Golden Winds and cuts it down to size for his apartment, I'm ashamed to say. And then he buys the Gazette de Beaux-Arts because he is a writer. He loves writing about art and looking at art. And I find in the archives of the Bibliothèque Nationale dinner lists of writers and poets, the kinds of people he wants to associate in the room or so. I have to say, never, the, the, the archivists in the Bibliothèque Nationale are absolute pits. That's my, um, <laughs> my top tip for the evening. But he loves art and artists love him. And there he is in the top hat, in the background of his friend Renoir's painting, now in the Philips collection, and he buys art. He loves it. He buys Renoir. He buys extraordinary paintings. This is in Chicago. He buys Monet. This is in the National Gallery. I've taken my children to weep over this picture, which is not which is theirs, it's all of ours. <laughs> not, put that in very square brackets. And he buys extraordinary paintings. He buys, in 15, 18 years, 62 Impressionist paintings of incredible quality. This is in the Met. He buys Bert Morisot and writes the first incredible article about Bert Morisot. He loves talking about art. He buys this. He goes to see the artist. The artist says, you know this painting. You all know this painting. And the artist says it's 1,000 francs. He gives 1,200 francs. He says it's, not, it's worth much more than that. And three days later, this arrives in the Rue Monceau. It has, quote, slipped from the bundle. <laughs> and this is a story I knew. So I'm in my studio in South London doing this story, and I know that story it has an echo. And I realize it turns up in Proust, because one of the people who's climbing up that staircase in the Rue de Monceau is the young Proust, the first extraordinary secretary of Charles Fritzi. And Charles becomes Charles Swan, becomes the aesthete, the lover, the melancholy man who loves art, here he is. And into this extraordinary mixture, he buys 264 Netsuke. He has a mistress, a rather glamorous mistress, more French cousins for me. <laughs> and it's the moment of Japanism, the moment when everyone is looking at Japanese art and falling in love with texture and with new materials and so what do you have? You have these little objects which you can pass around over dinner. Open up your vitrine and pass them round. But at this moment in his life, as he gets older and grander, this is the house that he's putting together with my cousin in Cap Ferrat. These netske no longer belong. They're a little bit risque. They're a little bit old hat. He's moved on. He lives in this kind of house where Donetsky belong in this kind of place. So what does he do with this vitrine of Netsuke? He gives them away. My great-grandfather is getting married. My great-grandfather is getting married in Vienna. So what happens all the way from Paris to Vienna goes a vitrine with these Netsuke, and it arrives in our Vienna branch of the family, who slightly overdo it, I think, <laughs> on the Ringstrasse. This is the family house. <laughs> Judenstrasse, the street of Jews, is what they call the Ringstrasse. 
in the 1870s when they're building this house. It's the house of a family that does not want to become wandering Jews. There are a series of palais. This is the Palais of Frussi. But down the road are many other houses of other Jewish families who have settled in this extraordinary cosmopolitan Jewish city, the city of ideas, of literature, of making things happen, a city where 30% of all the doctors are Jewish, where half the journalists, most of the writers, the financiers, a living city at the heart of Europe where all cultures come and make themselves known. In this ridiculous house on the Ringstrasse, my family house, there are lots of symbols of this new patrimony. This is the Ephrussi crest as you go in, but above you in the extraordinary ballroom, these ceilings of terrible guiltness, gildedness, guiltness, <laughs> guilt is Freud, gildedness is what I'm trying to talk about, <laughs> are incredible. I lay on the floor to the horror of the people who now live there and looked at these extraordinary wall paintings and realized uh, that it's the coronation of Esther. This is the only place in, 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 in a Jewish family life where Gentile families would come and be entertained. Uh, and this is the ballroom, but actually all the pictures on the roof are the destruction of the enemies of Israel. It's an extraordinarily coded ceiling for a Jewish family. And lots of harps. I have to say all the other rooms, the smoking rooms, are full of nymphs, but we won't go there. But this is where my great-grandfather, Victor, is getting married in a hurry. He's getting married in a hurry because the oldest son of this dynastic family has run away, eloped, with his father's mistress. Think about it. <laughs> it's Vienna. And so Victor, who collects books, who wants to write about Virgil, who's a scholar, has to become a bank banker and a fancier in a hurry and has to marry and have children. And so in desperation, he chooses the baroness from the palais next door, my great grandmother, Emmy, who likes dressing up and doesn't read Virgil. <laughs> and into this household comes this unlikely Parisian present of Netsuke. And they're put in her dressing room out of sight. It's the place where my grandmother and great aunt play as children. It's the only time they see their mother. It's the time when Elizabeth and Giselle play on the floor with these Netsuke while their mother is dressed by her maid, Anna, to go off for a ball or an assignation or the opera. So here, these little objects become familial. It's not a salon in Paris. It's family life in Vienna. And out of the window, my grandmother sees the university just across the Ringstrasse. And she knows that she has to get away from this gilded cage where she, too, will have to marry yet another banker. And so she decides that she is going to study, and she does. She crosses the Ringstrasse and becomes the first Jewish woman to get a degree in philosophy at the University of Vienna. I'm very proud of her. She's a poet, she's a fighter, and she crosses the road. And who else is in this household, this Viennese Jewish cosmopolitan family that moves all the time? But my great uncle Iggy. And my great uncle Iggy can't do sums, but he has to become the next in line. And so he too runs away. He runs away to New York because he's gay and because he loves fashion. And he becomes, as he says, the worst fashion designer of the 20th century. <laughs> and he may well have not been lying, but he runs away. Three years of research, and I know what's coming. I know what happens at the Anschluss. But there I find in Vienna what really happened 
at the Anschluss. That the night that the Nazis walk in to the city, the house is, the gates of the palais are left open by the doorman who's been with them for 50 years. That the door of their apartment is broken down. That my great-grandmother, who loved dressing up, is assaulted. That my great-grandfather, Victor, who loved Virgil, scrubs the street outside the family house until the brush breaks and then with his hands, until he has no skin on his hands. And that the next day, the systematic looting, like every other Jewish family in Vienna begins, the lists begin. They're beaten up, they're arrested, they're taken away. The family bank is aeronized and sold to the people who have been working in it for 60 years. And every single picture and object, every single memento and photograph, every single dress is taken away until they have nothing but the clothes they stand in. And my grandmother, who is a known Jewish intellectual and philosopher, goes back six weeks after the Anschluss to try and get them out. They're frozen. They're two people in their 70s, and they don't know what to do. And she manages to get them across the border to their house in the country, in Czechoslovakia, where my great-grandmother commits suicide. And my great-grandfather, Victor, in 1939, finally gets a visa. He finally gets a visa and comes to England with my father, who can't remember anything about anything that happened. And they arrive in April 1939, and they settle in Tunbridge Wells, a man who was born in Odessa, collected one of the great libraries of Vienna and saw it disappear on a truck down the Ringstrasse. He ends up with one book of Virgil and a book of Ovid in Tunbridge Wells. And he reads aloud to my father, who can't remember anything. And my great uncle Iggy, stranded in America, joins the American army and fights at Normandy. And this is his Jeep with his sister's name on it, which I find ridiculously moving. And he's there at the liberation of Paris. And he's there at the end of the war. And it's 1945, and the war has ended. And my grandmother decides she's going to go back to Vienna to find out what's happened. So she ends up in this ruined city, the place she was born in, her home. And she comes to the palais. And there's a nice American lieutenant there who lets her in and is amazed that one family lived in this ridiculous building. And there's nothing there. There's nothing there except, she said, furniture that was so ugly, even the SS wouldn't loot it. <laughs> and this lieutenant says, I don't know what happened, but there is someone here who might. And it's Anna. It's my great-grandmother's maid who dressed her for 30 years. Who, when the SA, the SS, Rosenberg himself were ransacking the palais and choosing what they wanted, took the Netzke one by one by one and hid them in her mattress and kept them. 
because they had a story. So in 1945, in a ruined house in Vienna, my grandmother gets given back a small case with Netsuke in it. A story, a sense of home. And she goes back to Tunbridge Wells with a suitcase with Netsuke in it. And later that year, Iggy arrives, demobbed from the American army. And that evening, they look at this collection of objects. What on earth are they going to do with it? There's nothing left. No old masters, no property, just this collection of objects that they played with as children. And Iggy, who is homeless, who cannot live in Europe, who is not American, decides there and then that he is, in his words, going to take them home. Amazingly and idiotically, in 1947, he takes that case to a destroyed Japan, a totally destroyed Tokyo. And here he is at the airport, such a good-looking man. And he builds a house in Tokyo with a vitrine for the Netsuke. Here they are. He makes a new home for these objects that have gone all the way from Japan to Paris to Vienna to Tunbridge Wells. And here, with his partner, Giro, who he loves and lives with forever, they make a house where they can open up the vitrine and have parties and hand them round, and where these objects have a different kind of storytelling. This is the apartment I saw when I was 17. A story, he said. There's a kind of story here. So I get the news that Iggy has died. And I love this man, and so I go back for his funeral. And I go to a Buddhist temple in the suburbs of Tokyo. And at the end of the ceremony, the abbot of the temple says to me, because I am the nearest blood relation of Iggy, would I say something about this man, this Viennese man who became homeless but found a home. So I say Kaddish in a Buddhist temple for my uncle. And then Jiro and I go back to this apartment, which I've known for decades. And I find out that Iggy has left me 264 Netsuke in his will. What are you supposed to do with that as a story? What are you supposed to do about that as a story? I have children. I've got responsibilities. I've got a proper job. I'm a potter. I make things. I'm not badly off. I'm quite well known. What the hell am I doing spending seven years tracing this story all the way around all these different dusty archives trying to work out as I walk down streets in all over these places to try and trace what the lineaments of a family that moved meant. What is it like to be a family that starts somewhere and goes somewhere else? What is the shape and tactility and feel and heft of this story? So I'm finally writing this up. It's seven years. That's an awfully long time. I know I'm banging on about it, but damn it, it's a long time. And so I go for the first time to Odessa. And I find this, 
this is typical. That's their house, that's their banking house, and that's the guest house. <laughs> and I finally end up here. It's beautiful. It's the first beginnings of a Jewish family before they move. Started in a shtetl, ended up here in Odessa, and then ended up somewhere else, even in Tunbridge Wells. And I go into this incredible first golden palais, and I find out from the very robust Ukrainian foreman that they have just finished renovating the whole place, taking out all the panelling, the plaster work, the iron work, and putting in air conditioning. It's lovely, isn't it, he says. But I sit in that window and look across in the chestnuts of the Black Sea, and I think that's a shape of story. That's a kind of shape of story. It's about what you have in your hand. It's about what home might mean. So I write it. I finished writing it. And my nice publisher says, there's not much market for Jewish memoir. 4,000 copies, they say. That's what we'll do. And it gets published here. And it gets published in America and in Germany. And then it finally gets published in Austria. So I go with my father, my Jewish Anglican father, <laughs> and my wife and my two oldest children, who are only 10 and 9 at that moment. And we go back to the Palais Ephrussi. And there in the courtyard of the Palais, the courtyard where the neighbors looted their house, where the SS threw the furniture down into the courtyard, I stand up with my father and my children, and I talk about homecoming. And then I realize what it's about. Because at that moment, when I finished talking, my dad walks off with my two boys and says, I can remember. So, what's the shape of the story? The shape of the story might be that, that there's a possibility of homecoming, that there's a kind of end, a kind of shape, as I see my dad finally going up a staircase with my sons to show him where he had his breakfast every day, the place he couldn't remember. But then I get an invitation from Vienna. It's an invitation from the Kunsthistorische Museum. <coughs> Any invitation is difficult from Vienna. <laughs> the Kunsthistorische Museum, the wonderful museum, the great museum of the world, is also the place where the systematic looting was organized from. But they say, generously, that they have this wonderful temple in the Volksgarten. It's beautiful, a neoclassical temple very white, a place where every year they ask an artist to make a temporary installation. So what am I going to make for Vienna? I make a pair of vitrines. That's what I do. I make porcelain. I was making porcelain this morning. I have white clay on my hands. I make things out of possibly the most fragile material that exists. It's beautiful and ethereal, and it moves in extraordinary ways, and it's very dangerously pure. So for 
this temple, I make this pair of vitrines. And I call them Lichtzwang, which means light duress. They're words that come from this man, Selan. Selan was born in Romania to a Jewish family. He saw his parents deported. He saw his family deported. And he writes in German. It's his first language. But for him, German is also a problem. He's a poet who loves language. But he says, I am homeless in this language. He writes endlessly about white. White, he says, is the color my mother's hair would never get. White, he says, in an extraordinary poem on homecoming, Heimkehr, he says, snowfall, denser and denser, dove-colored as yesterday, snowfall, as even now you were sleeping. White, stacked into distance, above it, endless, the sleigh track of the lost, on each fetched home into its today, as I slipped away, wooden a post, there a feeling blown across by the ice wind, its snow-colored cloth as a flag. White for him is a possibility of coming home. It's also an impossibility. And so endlessly, endlessly, this great poet in German breaks the language open, tries to get it to work in different ways. He writes with great difficulty about the language he loves. He's also impossible. He's asked to give a speech. He's a man who hates standing up in public. An answer to a, huge, a scholar who writes him a 12-page letter is the answer, no. He's given a prize by a German university. And he tries to stand up and talk about poetry. Ladies and gentlemen, he says, after 25 minutes, permit me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, he says, after 40 minutes. He can't make it work anymore. But he says that that's what it's about. Homecoming, language. So in Vienna, this is what I do, this piece, Lichtzwang. So I write this poem on the wall of this temple. And for a year, it's there, this poem about whiteness and homecoming. And tramps come in, and mums, when it's raining, with their kids. And the Viennese critics hate it, but there you go. But it's there. And then I come home. And when I come home, I make another piece another piece, which is the black version, <coughs> Black Milk. I remember that Celan wrote a poem about blackness, too. So for the first time, I make black milk. I make white porcelain turn black. So that's what I do. And then, last year, another invitation from Berlin. So what am I going to do in Berlin as a potter? Berlin is an extraordinary, difficult city. Its difficulties don't match those of Vienna, but they are profound. So for my guide to Berlin, I take the extraordinary writer, philosophy, collector, Walter Benjamin the great Jewish intellectual of the 20th century, the man who knows about how to write, how to collect, how to see. He says that walking down the city street, 
you need to be a rag picker because rag pickers pick up the discarded things along the way. You need to be a flaneur because the flaneur and the rag picker are poets. They see the things that no one else sees. And this is the city he grew up in and maps. And so I walk round Berlin rather idiotically with this wonderful man's writings in my hand. This is the city he grew up in, a Berlin childhood, one of the most lyrical books about what it is to explore a city when you're this high. All the things you see, all the things you know, the heat and the cold, the gifts and the estrangements of the city. So I work with the Walter Benjamin Archive in Berlin and they find me and I find them. Here he is, he's myopic. You can see how close this is in the Bibliothèque Nationale. He's looking with incredible detail at these extraordinary cards. Everything is here for him, very, very close by. And he's endlessly trying to map what he knows and what he can't find. This is a strange notebook I found. It's in my exhibition in Berlin at the moment. It's a list of every book he's re read. These are the Berlin pages, 1,213 down on the bottom right-hand corner. He's obsessive. He's obsessive about keeping things. He writes in smaller and smaller fragments. He writes on bus tickets. And after 1933, this extraordinary philosopher is also yet another homeless exile. So what am I going to do for Berlin? I make my first archive. This is the first time I bring writing and fragments together. It's a piece called Archiv, which I've just found is going to be lent to the Jewish Museum in Berlin on long-term loan. I'm very moved by that. And on all the walls surrounding this piece and surrounding these small, fragmentary things that Benjamin tried to keep, I write on the walls because writing on the walls is very good. You have no idea what that says. You can't read any of it. But what it is doing is me trying to do a mapping of my love of Benjamin. And then I make big vitrines. They're almost as big as this screen. My collections, which talk to his collections. These beautiful vessels kept in some kind, some kind of careful disposition, because that's what vitrines do. And some of them are black. This piece is called The Task of the Critic. So in this gallery, which looks out over Benjamin's old school in Berlin, I put together a whole exhibition about what it is to not have the things you love with you. I make this piece on the eve of departure. It's a series of broken objects, things held together and things which have not been held together because actually some of these things are more important as fragments than as intact vessels. On the eve of departure, what do you take? Benjamin, the homeless man, the man who carries in his head all these languages, who carries these conversations, who carries this knowledge. Finally, in 1940, is in the Pyrenees within sight of Spain when he's told that the border is closed. And in Poor Bou, he takes his life. So I make a reliquary for him, a piece called Poor Bou. He has with him an attache case with what he said was his most important manuscript. But when they find him, it's gone. Poor Boo. What do you do with what you cannot find?
what do you do at that moment of homelessness? So in Berlin, I have two galleries. And one is intimate, and it's full of these vitrines. And the other, I find, is the old sorting office for Charlottenburg. It's where all the mail went for 100 years. So I'm thinking obsessionally in my South London studio about what it is to go to the sorting office in Berlin in the 1920s, the 1930s, what it is to send a letter in Berlin, and what it is to be homeless. So I make the biggest thing I've ever made. It's a piece called Ehrkunst, which means the art of getting lost. It's huge. It's as big as this hall. It's a series of very large black wooden cabinets, like packing cases. But within these packing cases, which are very high, are apertures. There are moments where you can look in, and I have put porcelain objects some of them are out of focus. Some of them are hidden and can be seen. And there are some places where there are nothing but piles of shards. But it's a kind of attempt to make a resting place for memory. It sounds absurd, but perhaps memory is actually a place. Perhaps it's possible to reach and find a way of looking at what it is to be at home or homeless through objects. So this Irkunst, this huge piece, is my way of thinking about Berlin and homelessness. And then, for Benjamin, the man who dies in 1940, the man who talked with such tenderness about unpacking his library, his library of books that he loved. I make a library for the person of the book. And for this library in Berlin, I collect 250 editions of his work in all the languages I can find. So that for three months, and it's still on, go this weekend. <laughs> you can sit in Berlin, whatever nationality you are, at a long library table covered with a map of Benjamin's birthplace, Berlin, and there are all these books in every edition, every edition going, including Japanese. And you can sit and read, and I've given people paper and pencils and a great big fat stamp, which when you stamp the paper says, Archiv. And I've been getting letters it started a month ago, and I've been getting letters with every post from people who are sitting and spending time and writing. And some of them, possibly, are writing home. So, pots and books. Pots and books. So, I make a final, final piece. It's called A Berlin Chronicle. And you can see it as you walk down the street before you go into this gallery. And it's just a series of five small vitrines. But in each of them are broken pots and bits of lead and things I found earkunst when I'm getting lost on the streets. It's a kind of temporary home for memory. It's my kind of homecoming. It's what I try and do. Thank you. Thank you.
actually a question. We have a question. First of all, thank you so much. You're an amazing raconteur, and I think we could have spent hours listening to you. Um, I thank wonder you. how you felt at such a young age, at 17, just taking off and going to Japan. And how did your parents feel, just a 17-year-old going somewhere so far away? Um, uh, firstly, I don't think my parents noticed. <laughs> I was the, th the, th the, th the third of four children. By that point, I think they'd already slightly given up on any sense of what was happening. Um, um, I don't honestly think they noticed I was being a potter either. I mean, it was, it was, it was the 70s. Um, uh, um, I, I loved it. I loved the feeling of, 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 um, of aloneness. I mean, it's extraordinary to think back that you, know, you couldn't get in touch. I think now I'd hate it if my kids went off and did that. But um, uh, there was that sense of just, just being totally alone, which I loved, making it up as you went along. And then, I mean, it was a very, you know, and, and I knew it was pots. I'd, been a, I'd, I'd started making pots when I was a kid, so I knew I was going to be a potter. It seemed like the obvious thing to do, to go. And then I came back and I was apprenticed for a couple of years. So that was my beginnings. And then I read English, but then it was pots again. So it's been, it's just been this ridiculous thing. Pots and books. Sorry, I saw you on Arts Review, and you went to Dresden, and that was very interesting when you saw the pottery there. And I'm surprised, you know, my feeling would, would be I'd want to smash it, but they were very beautiful objects. <laughs> so Sorry, that's a ridiculous <laughs> question. But. So, so, having finished doing this book about my family, I, the second book I've done, which has just come out, which is called The White Road, is a kind of autobiography about, about this journey into whiteness, into this journey into why, why I've been obsessed with the colour white and what it is to make use porcelain, use this extraordinary material. And so it's a journey, it's sort of pilgrimage really to China where porcelain begins. But then secondly, and complicatedly to, to Meissen, where, to Dresden, where, where, of course, porcelain is reinvented in the 18th century. This incredible alchemical moment when they, after years of tribulation, they discover how to make white porcelain. And it's incredible. It's a great moment. And, and, and there's the white porcelain. It's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And then five years later, it's just gilded into absolute, you know, it's just gold and flowers. And, and it's bourgeois. And it's appalling. Um, uh, but there's this moment right at the beginning of, 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 of Meissen when they can't really believe that they've created something so pure, so translucent. So early, early Meissen is, is fantastic. And then it all goes, it goes, it goes, they start making menageries and, and, and dinner services for endless countesses. And, and damn it, all those harlequins, all that crap. So then that all goes wrong. But there's this moment of whiteness at the beginning. Uh, um, and I, I, I inherited from my dearly beloved grandmother a Meissen bowl from the 1770s. And I was looking at it when I was writing this book. And I, it's, it's, got, it's got lots and lots of fruit painted meticulously all over it and a golden rim. And I look at this hard and I say, this is passive aggressive porcelain. <laughs> so I own that statement. It is passive aggressive porcelain. Wondering if your father didn't remember anything and he became an Anglican, mm. oh, how important was your Jewish heritage for you as you were growing up? And is it more important now than then? I had no Jewish heritage when I was growing up. So you didn't even know? No. I mean, I, I, there was this sort of rumor off that, that of, of sort of that, you know, Europe, I mean, a European family that had begun elsewhere, there was all that kind of stuff, but no, no real connection at all to, 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 the, to, to this, this story, this, this Jewishness. And so in some ways, you know, this sort of, this, this, this complicated inheritance that I got given by my great uncle, this, this thing he gives me. You know, inheritance can be very complicated. What's he giving me? <laughs> he gives me because, because, 
because I, I love him, he loves me, but he's also giving me a, a problem. And unpacking that problem was, was emerging into this, this thing about what's told and where the silences are in families. And, you know, now my, my dad's almost 90 now, and, and he's, he's, I think, very, very Jewish. But did he change once he started remembering? I think, I think he started talking. You know, I, it's, it's, he, you know he's still absolutely an Anglican minister in his 90, you know, 80s. But, but I think he connected to, to, to something that, that he couldn't... If you think about being a child of eight, nine, a, a refugee who only speaks German and arrives in 1939 just as war is declared, you know, he became more English than English. You know, he, 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 he took something on as a sort of self-protection. I don't decry him that at all. I think that's what happened. Um, do I feel Jewish? I, I, I'm, I, of course. <laughs> I mean, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, it's very important to me. I mean, it's part of, it's part of this peculiar thing of this inheritance. I just wondered how long it took you to write The White Road. The White Road, I'm, I'm speeding up. That was five years. <laughs> it I'm, seems I'm incredibly, really... like an incredibly detailed history of every country <laughs> in the whole world. Um, it's just unbelievable, as well as incredibly beautiful, and I thought it would have taken a lot longer. Well, I, I, I thank you very much. That's a lovely... Did you all hear that? That was a lovely testimony <laughs> from, from this incredibly educated audience we have here. Um, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, it's f five years of, of sort of active research, but, but, but you know what? I, I have been thinking about it for a while. <laughs> so... Um, you know, a lot of those research trips were, were, were in the last five years, but a lot of, a lot of the other thinking about it was over... I mean, I mean I, I've been doing this all my life, so it's, it's not... I, I've, it's that kind of story. Um, but writing takes time. I mean, researching takes time, but writing takes a huge amount of time. And so... What I find I do is, is, is that I often end up by making in the day and then writing all night, because at night is the only time that there's any, any silence at all. So there are complicated years where I seem to have passed by entirely on sleep. So maybe I'm, I'm doubling up five, five years like that. There's one lady here in the second row. How did you get the name Deval? Because my grandmother Elizabeth married a Dutchman, Hendrik Deval. So uh, he, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit Dutch, a bit Viennese, a bit English, and a bit Scottish. <laughs> so I'm a good, proper European. <laughs> yes. I noticed in your telling that when you came to the bit about taking your father with your sons back to the place that he remembered his childhood, that that opened for you what memory was. And it seemed to me that that was the key. Perhaps it's the way you were telling it, but you were emotionally involved in that and that that was the key to memory for you. I don't know if that's, that was so. I think that... I think we've all experienced somewhere in our lives that moment of, of extraordinary um, vulnerability when suddenly you see someone... you see someone's openness to life or... or, or they, they're, they're, there's a sort of exposure for them. And it's often, if you're lucky, late in life, when, when there's that moment of, of transition, when suddenly childhood becomes very close to you. But what I discovered, having written this book, 
um, suddenly was that, of course, this is, is just one story amongst tens and tens of thousands of other stories about silences, about what you get told and what you don't get told in families. What I had absolutely no inkling of when I wrote this, um, but from the correspondence and the reaction, is that, of course, this is just one, and it's got impressionists as part of it and all that stuff. But that's not the heart of it at all. It's a completely common story, which is where do you come from and how much do you tell the people you love about what you know? And that's it. That's the DNA of any story. And that's about homelessness. That's about where you identify your beginning. It's hugely significant emotionally. It's, it's, and it's the beginning of lots of kinds of storytelling. It's across every culture. So I get this when I get letters still years after I wrote this book. But I get it when I'm in a cab in LA when the Somali taxi driver starts telling me about where he's come from. And I say, well, have you told your kids? And he says, no, because I want them to be American, because that's important. Or I get it in, you know, I get it all over the place. And it's an extraordinarily significant thing about where do you belong and where do you belong anew. So of course, it's very emotional because it matters. There's a gentleman here. Yes, one, one, last, question. one last question here. And then we can all have a drink. <laughs> you and your drink. Um, pots and books. Pots and books. Pots and books. Writing and potting. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think you've got a single unifying aesthetic value which you use or draw on, whether you're potting or writing? Yes. And what is that? It's making. There's something about the physicality of objects and the physicality for me of words, the shaping of a phrase um, on a page is very, very, very close to me to the physicality of putting objects down uh, on a shelf or in a vitrine. And, and, and poetry, which is why poetry matters so much to me, because you feel the shape of the words as you say them, also you see them visually on a page. That's why Celan is so hugely significant to me as a poet. So I think of myself as a maker, and it just happens sometimes to end up in a vitrine in a museum or on someone's wall, but sometimes it ends up in a book. Uh, that's not bullshit. That's really how I feel about it. And I finally feel like now I'm in my 50s, I've come out and said, actually, that's what I do. So that's what I do. I make things. <laughs>